The journey into faith often begins with a profound sense of love, infatuation even, much like the ardent longing described in the Song of Solomon, the intoxicating allure of faith with its promise of divine intimacy and spiritual fulfillment draws us in, offering a sense of joy and purpose that feels unparalleled. This love, this fervent devotion can feel better than any earthly pleasure, surpassing anything believed to be more exquisite. But what happens when this divine romance is shattered by the stark realization that a religious experience has been fraudulent? The kisses that once brought joy now leave a bitter taste. The love that once uplifted us now feels like a cruel deception. The love and the joy within the kisses of all religion is gone. How it made us feel and think no longer matters because we are seeing that the relationship wasn't about love. A sensual experience deceived us. As we awaken from the dreamlike state of infatuation, we begin to see the true nature of our religious experience. The realization cuts deep, leaving us with a sense of betrayal and disillusionment. We find ourselves on a path that leads not to enlightenment but to a metaphorical death. Our steps, once confident and filled with purpose, now feel uncertain and lead us into a shadowy realm where clarity is elusive. The bliss once felt is replaced by a growing awareness of the emptiness and falsehood that underpinned our faith. This awakening brings with it a profound sense of grief. We mourn the loss of the comforting illusions that sustained us. The cries of Job echo within us as we grapple with the futility of our previous belief. We realize that our religion, which promised light, has been a land of darkness where even the light is as dark as night. The rituals, understanding, and routines that once seemed meaningful now feel empty and devoid of true connection. In this crisis, we recognize the illogical nature of our religious routines, the character of the deity we once worshipped, the behavior of its followers, and the teachings of its leaders. The inconsistencies and contradictions become glaringly apparent, leaving us questioning everything we once held dear. Yet, this crisis is not a reflection of our failure. It is not our fault that we have risen above the confines of our religious experience. This painful process of deconversion is a necessary step towards a more authentic and fulfilling spiritual and intellectual life. As we leave behind the shadows of our past beliefs, we begin to seek a new path, one that aligns more closely with our true selves and our deepest values. The journey of deconversion, though fraught with pain and confusion, ultimately leads towards a more genuine and meaningful experience. We move from a place of deception and illusion to one of revelation and clarity. In this new light, we find a renewed sense of purpose and a deep connection to the Bible unencumbered by the constraints of a fraudulent religious experience. Being able to mentally diagnose our problems, that assists us in moving forward in our devotional experience. Religious trauma has been the watchword, or the watch phrase, but where does trauma come from? All trauma comes from crisis. Crisis is the means whereby trauma occurs, so experiencing religious trauma and its symptoms that's due to having experienced a crisis. The trauma that occurs to the conscience of the devotional conversation, the feelings that arise from such an experience, that's due to having suffered crisis. But from where? Right? What, what, what crisis? What crisis could we have possibly suffered to allow us to now have this sort of dissonant experience with religion and with possibly even the Bible. And then not simply just with religion and then not simply just with the a relationship with the Bible, but with a relationship with our devotional character. What What's the crisis that caused that? Well, I want to submit to you that we are going to learn about crisis and its act and behavior to the devotional experience. But I will submit to you that that crisis is due to a failure of, of the in, infatuation, not sensual infatuation, religious infatuation, theological infatuation, religious theoretical infatuation, 
the infatuation with the community of what religion provides. Our infatuation with our religious experience and with our religious belief, our infatuation with that, and for some of us, a majority, with the religious community, the religious community and that infatuation, every, every bit of that has come to a bit of a, a halt. The infatuation has died. When the infatuation dies, when something has disturbed the infatuation, when something has caused the infatuation to wake up, to no longer be an infatuation, driven by passion, human impulse. When human impulse, which is mistaken for love and, and, and passion, when that's disturbed, crisis happens. What kind of crisis though? How, where, where can we attribute this crisis to? Looking in the Bible, Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, one, two through four. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. It is the joy within the kisses of our religion that we have become infatuated with. That love, it's gone now. How it made us feel and think it no longer matters because we are seeing that the relationship wasn't actually about love. A sensual experience deceived us. We are seeing that the experience was about passion and it really wasn't about love. We really never knew the difference. It's really easy. It's really easy in a normal relationship to confuse love and passion. It's, it's really very easy to do so. When you're in a relationship where love and passion is, is, is confused, all of a sudden it becomes about ownership, right? It becomes about ownership. When you don't have a clear perspective on how affection is, when you don't have an intelligent affection, you will confuse the love you have for someone else with passion. You won't know it. And that confusion between love and passion will drive you to now believe that you own that person. So you don't actually love them. You're not actually loving. You're believing in the respect of ownership. And that's driving the relationship in a way that is not sentimental. And if it is, it is a sentimental due to the psychological effect of what ownership can give you as a stimulus, internally, mentally, emotionally, uh, spiritually. When the relationship isn't based on actual intellectual affection, it will turn to passion and of the lowest sort, of the basest sort. And it's no different for our relationship with our devotional conversation. When our devotional conversation is in ownership, when we are wanting to own it, when we believe we own our devotional experience, that can last for however long it will last. But there's going to come a point in time where our devotional conversation will say to us, you don't own me. I am my own, just as another person would tell us eventually. You don't own me. I need to have my own character. I need to have my own possessions. I need to have my own ed ed educational field of thought, learning, action, behavior. I, I, need to, I need to exist. When our devotional conversation starts doing that, that's when our human being, or should I say the human religious being, begins to realize that what they thought they loved wasn't love. The kisses they received from the main figure of their religion, the warmth and the affection, it was infatuation. It wasn't reasonable. Now, all of a sudden, reason is, is, is rising up. Reason is rising up. There are a lot of things that are not making sense now because the infatuation is wearing off. Something has occurred to awaken the conscience of the being 
for the devotional conversations experience something has happened something has happened for the devotional conversations character to arise within itself to make the human being aware that it needs its own individual experience and all of a sudden the infatuation with what bridged the gap between the human being and the devotional experience it's shown to be fraudulent it's shown to be nothing but vanity an infatuation that has and had never any bit of substance behind it we were deceived by the kisses we were deceived by the affection we were deceived by the community we were deceived by the theories we were deceived by the feeling that it gave us and now that the feeling is wearing off for some reason now that a crisis has happened in our understanding the infatuation is dying and we are experiencing many different levels of trauma so remember the the author of the songs of solomon they're letting us know that it is the kisses of the mouth of the beloved that caused a stimulus to arise and moved devotion towards something that was believed to be a credible experience the kisses the mouth of the beloved deceived us why 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 this why the infatuation with the mouth why the infatuation with those lips and kisses turn into the book of proverbs proverbs 5 3 and 4 what are we realizing actually for the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil but her end is bitter as wormwood sharp as a two-edged sword the hurt we feel the hurt we feel is due to us realizing the character of our religion and the character of that religion's source. It's strange and that strangeness has left us bitter. Looking in Proverbs 5, 5 and 6, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. We went from an experience of bliss. We went from an experience of infatuation to now an experience of death. What's happening is that we're, we are waking up from the coma of infatuation to the path of life. The problem is, is that the religious experience cannot allow understanding what the path of life is that's the crisis <laughs> the crisis is is that the more we realize if we continue on this path this tread of a religious experience of a routine religious experience of an organized theoretical religious experience the more we're getting away from actually understanding what the path of life is so staying there we kill our conscience and we never know the path of life. Exiting, we yet kill our conscience because we're going to know the path of life. <laughs> the crisis is an understanding. The crisis of realizing infatuation and the crisis of realizing the need and the want and the desire for understanding and knowing that our current religious setting, religious landscape, religious belief, religious experience, religious community, religious theory won't do it for us. Crisis. Immediate crisis. And we can go a number of routes. A number of routes we can go. We can go, sure, this has been wrong. Let me find out what right is. Or we can go, this has been wrong. Nothing's ever going to be right. Or we can go, this has been wrong. Maybe there's a right, maybe there isn't, I don't know. No matter what we do, within us, the conscience of our devotional conversation will never die. It will forever be attached to understanding what right is. It is our responsibility to take accountability when fact, when inspiration, when understanding dawns upon the being of our human to give to our devotional conversation what it needs because in essence that's what we are we are what is within 
denying what is within and just maintaining whatever we want to maintain based upon this skin and its stimulus or based upon the visual stimulus we get from what's outside of us, that will cause a death to arise. We have been in death in a religious belief and for not taking responsibility and accountability, we exist further in death due to that same belief, knowing that we need to make sense of it. Crisis. Crisis. And it's a crisis because we're, we're, we're taking the route of challenging everything we thought we knew. We're taking the route of challenging everything that we thought we knew to make sense of it. And the fear is that what we will uncover will challenge everything we knew. We will have to make a life change. We will have to make a routine change. We will have to make a belief change. We will have to make a, a mindset shift. And the human being, not just, I'm not talking about individual or whatever this is general generally the human being is lazy the human being likes what's easy the human being likes what to be told someone goes up to a mountain comes down to us tells us what to do we will do it we don't want to hear from the deity ourselves we want to do it you be our god we want to hear what is easy and we want to be told what to do that's how we're built all of us when all of a sudden we're realizing that what we were told to do is wrong, all of a sudden what is within us is having a mind of its own. That's scary. That's a crisis. But at the same time, that's life. And what is within us is calling us out of the path of the zombie, out of the path of the zombie, to the path of understanding, to the higher education that is for the living mind the living human being within this realm called Earth. Knowing Bible is a course for learners wanting to grow closer to themselves and to their Creator. There is a reason why we trust the Bible. There is a reason why the Bible moves us to celebrate it. There is also a reason why we feel hesitant to let the Bible's words satisfy us. Traditional religious theory isn't always satisfactory. Carrying a belief without proof will soon aggravate our thoughts and feelings. Knowing Bible is a course that is designed to wake us up to who and what our belief is. Knowing Bible is for learners that want a living experience beyond conventional religion. Don't let this educational opportunity slip away from you. Remember that scene in the School of the Prophets, Elijah, Elisha, sorry, Elisha and, and his assembly. Remember when they were eating and then one shouted out and said to Elisha, there is a death in the pot. And then Elisha came across and did whatever he did, whatever he did, finagled that pot. And all of a sudden it was right. What is the death? that our devotional conversation is realizing in the pot that has been its religious experience. What is being realized? What is being realized to drive a shift in mindset? Looking in the book of Job, Job 10, 18 to 22. Wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Oh, that I had given up the ghost and no eye had seen me. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Cease then and leave me alone, that I may take comfort a little. Before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness in the shadow of death, a land of darkness, as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness." Now, Jeremiah, as we saw, as I touched on in the, in the last concerning religious trauma, experienced the same thing that Job did and cried the same sentiment. Why is Job crying the same sentiment as Jeremiah? Job's realizing that there is a difference between the deity of religion and the living mind that the living God is. He did it all. We have to remember who were, who is Job, right? Let's just put this into modern context. Job went to church. Job offered sacrifice and offering to God. 
sang those praises, believed in the theories, prayed for others, brought others into the theories, lived for the deity, believed the deity lived for him. Job did everything right, right? Job did everything right. But did right happen to Job? All of the right that Job did, he thought that he did it for his protection, right? He thought it was for his protection. I'm going to believe in Jesus because when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's a religious law that Job committed himself to. I'm going to eat this and drink that because I believe whatever that is. And I'm assimilating to myself what I believe that is. I will be protected in good. That was Job. Job did it all. Job did it all. I'm going to stand by these principles, the fundamental principles of, of my religious denomination. I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand by it because these are given by our deity. And I'm going to teach them because these are given and sanctioned by our deity. I will be well. Job did it all. But what happened to Job? All of the righteousness that he thought he amounted by doing all of this, it amounted for absolutely nothing. <laughs> it amounted for nothing. Job was not temporally protected from doing temporal, spiritual, religious routines. Job was not secularly protected by believing on secularly implemented religious theories. Job was not protected at all, which begins his elocution in frustration. This Job has a very right reason to be frustrated and to listen to no one, especially Elihu, who made the most sense out of them all. He doesn't have to listen to that, even though that is the most logical. Job did everything right. Job, Job was the perfect, the perfect subject. Through ritual, belief, theory, offering, sacrifice, tradition, holy or holiday, and so on. And none of it benefited him at all. Hence this cry now. I did it all for you. I did it all for you. And I did it all for me. Because I believe within my heart to the sincere that you valued all of this. But the fact that you would spend time on me, over and over he says, what is a man that you would care to zone in on him. What is a man? You are God. Don't you have anything else to do? The lesson. The lesson. No religious deed. No religious law. No religious theory. No religious belief. No religious anything is valued to any quote unquote deity. That's the frustration. And the frustration occurred so that the main character of this book of Job could understand that there is a difference between the initiation to a deity and being initiated into understanding. There's a difference. And in that difference, the separation is in how the individual is respecting the experience and not respecting the experience. The difference is in how the individual is hearkening to the experience and not hearkening to the experience. When it comes to Job, the lesson is, is that what's really going on within us concerning how we believe our devotion should be carried out, it's not what's going on within the quote-unquote deity concerning how our devotion should be carried out. Crisis. Crisis. And it is this crisis that causes every single individual that should allow their conversation to experience it, to cry out, why was I ever conceived? Or in better language, why do I now have sense? Why do I now have sense that the living mind of the living God has nothing to do with what I gave myself to? Realizing that we are not learning anything within our devotional experience, we have a crisis. We got a problem. We're not learning anything. The experience is not intellectual and it is not intellectually spiritual. We want to learn more, but we can't so long as we remain within the tread of the religious path that we are on. So long as we engage our belief, we won't be learning anything. We know it within us. That's the crisis. 
We have been doing everything. We have been everywhere for our belief. We have not done things for our belief. And we are realizing that for some reason, we are still being punished and are punishing ourselves. We are realizing that what we are giving, the energy that we are giving, it's not being given back. Something's not right. Something's not real. The crisis is happening because what's wearing off is our infatuation with the mouth and with the lips of our religious institution. There is something more real that we are craving and desiring. And because we aren't having it, because we're not getting it, because we never have and because we're realizing that so long as we are here, we never will, we're feeling anxiety is settling in. Grief is settling in. Frustrations rising up. Moving on to anger, ultimately due to the sorrow that is within us. That crisis that is caused by trauma, it is a crisis that is caused due to something wearing off. And what's wearing off isn't, you know, it has been a human experience. It has been a human impulse to believe what we believe just because it's, who knows, we have our own experiences with our own reasoning and logic behind it. But there's going to come a point in time, and I'm always saying that, when what is within us, especially the conscience of our devotional conversation, is going to knock on the door of our intellect. It's going to remind us that we have a brain. And it's going to remind us that we have consciousness to achieve. It's going to remind us that we have an experience to know and that we can't really know that experience until it actually has its intellectual and intellectually moral self registered. We have, we will get that experience. All of us will. And depending on how we take accountability for that, that's going to determine how much trauma we're able to make sense of and to overcome. Until then, we're going to be sounding like Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, 11 to 20. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a whale that thou settest the watch over me? When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me with visions, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. I loathe it. I would not live always. Let me alone, for my days are vanity. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him and, thou, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him? And that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment. How long will thou not depart from me, nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee? O thou preserver of men, what hast thou set me? Why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? Do we hear this? Do we hear this? Because this is a sentiment that is in 2024 relatable. The individual here is suffering religious trauma. They've done everything so that God can leave them alone. They've done everything so that God can, can leave them alone and provide for them. I'm doing the sacrifices so my children can have blessings. I'm making these prayers so that my crops can have growth. I'm doing all of these ordinances and, and believing and teaching on these religious theories so that I can have the economic prosperity in return for that because that's due. You're a deity. You like sacrifices. I'm a human. I like economy. I'm not here simply just as a, 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 a body that's without a body like you. I'm here with a body and I have needs. So when I do this, you need to do that for me so that I can keep doing this for you and you can keep doing that for me. This transaction that we believe exists does not exist. Again, this transaction that we believe to where we can do with our bodies to please what is invisible, to receive from what is invisible something for our bodies is a transaction that does not exist. Job found that out, just as we all do. And it is that experience that moved the main character to believe that he is now a harm to himself. Why? Because the suffering that he is experiencing, he is equating it to a non-existence of the deity. 
I did all of this. Everything that was done made the deity real. Everything that was believed on made the deity real. And it was like stock to have some some cachet that when something happens, listen, I'm, I'm here to cash in my eating of the wafer and drinking of that. I'm here to cash in my belief every Sunday or a Saturday. I'm, I'm here to cash in my community experience every Wednesday. I'm here to cash that in because something's going on with me. Doesn't work that way. And it's because it doesn't work that way. And it doesn't have to always occur in that instance. It can also be mental and philosophical, which at the same time, it always comes to sort of be. The shift happens in mindset and disposition to cause a bit of an awakening, you could say, to take place that maybe this isn't how the quote-unquote deity works. Maybe quote-unquote God isn't really here for all of that. And then the questions arise. And then from the questions, more questions arise. And then from the questions and the more questions that arise, somehow it gets turned around that we are our own problem, that we are the problem, that we are ugly, that our experience has been false, that everything we thought we experienced has not been for anything. Somehow we turn to blame ourselves instead of actually looking at what's going on. What's actually going on is a process of deconversion. Deconversion from something that has really never actually in reality existed. We're deconverting from nothing. And yet it, it's a deconversion because our mind has been transformed by the experience. But ne nevertheless, we're deconverting from nothing. And it's appearing to be traumatic because we're seeing that that nothing has been the experience thus far. And if we continue on it, it will continue to be nothing. We will not grow. We will continue to be frustrated with ourselves. And the hate will simply just increase. And we won't, we won't know why. In a world bound by tradition, imagine liberating your spiritual journey beyond structured norms. Discover why it is important to devote time to mentally claiming your spirituality. Let the Bible guide and enrich your devotional culture, transcending a traditional religious experience. Consider meditating on the Bible's mind to better experience a spirituality that is personal and profound. Embrace the sanctuary of the Bible's words to connect deeply with your inner spiritual landscape. Reflect on what you think you know, creating a personalized path to enlightenment. Your spiritual journey is uniquely yours. Let personal mental devotional culture guide you beyond the conventional into a realm of personal devotion. The quote-unquote deity, quote-unquote God, along with our religion and our religious experience, it is becoming grotesque. Why? The study of deconversion situates its focus on the rejection of religion rather than on the positive aspects of reconversion to a non-religious worldview. The conversion perspective focuses on what is gained rather than on what is left behind. Religion plays a major role in easing the convert's transformation by proving, by providing an institutionalized set of guidelines for beliefs, behaviors, and expectations that are socially supported and reinforced. Once ideological destination is identified, embraced, and immediately available, all positive emotional responses arise from a sense of control and reliance on a higher power, a sense of assurance, feeling of ecstasy, and liberation through self-surrender. So there's our answer for why the experience is now suffering the trauma that it is. We are suffering the trauma because we are realizing that the immediate and the available emotional, spiritual, and religious support that we once had, whether from community or from the quote-unquote deity or both combined, it's no longer there. We felt good surrendering ourselves to something that we believed was greater and higher than ourselves. We felt good being encased in what we thought that role was supposed to be in our life, but the, the problem is, is that it's simply feeling. When you're only feeling and you're never adding anything intellectual to thought, your emotions and character will drop. When you're only feeling and you're never adding anything intellectual to what is felt, but you're only relying on an emotional stimulus to funnel that, that experience through, all thought, feeling, action, behavior, or I should say all character will drop. 
it will drop because character should not be built on feeling because feeling is ultimately deceptive. That's why the infatuation is wearing off. The infatuation which was made to exist through feeling, right? We do things for quote unquote God and we feel good. We go there when we feel good. We don't do when we feel good. We're constantly feeling. The feeling is what drives us to know. But the problem is, is that there is no feeling with understanding. Feeling has to be made rational. If feeling is not made rational, we're going to confuse infatuation for love. We're going to confuse passion for love. We're going to confuse infatuation, passion, or human impulse, affectionate human impulse for love. And it's, it's really not, and it's going to wear us down. The deconversion perspectives rely on crisis rhetoric to situate spiritual struggle at the narrative core, emphasizing movement away from faith. Ideological destinations are often ambiguous or unknown. Disillusionment and disenchantment preceding deconversion provoke feelings of rejection, alienation, grief, and guilt. Biographical reconstruction draws on emotionally charged metaphors that convey emotional pain and become incorporated into the deconversion crisis rhetoric. The emphasis is kept on the loss of the old self in all religious ties, while the individual reaffirms a commitment to seeking truth, morality, and community. The issue here, the issue here isn't with a philosophical experience with the scriptures. The positive aspect of what we're going through is that we are embracing a, a living experience from a non-religious worldview because the religious worldview has failed us somehow. We have to, in our own self, understand where that, where and what that failure is and what it traces back to. But the positive the overall scope is that we are now having no issue, and we never had an issue with the Bible philosophically. The issue was with the religious experience, and the religious experience, due to it being a land of darkness, as the main character of Job said, it is a, a land of darkness where the light in that land is as the darkness. What's interesting about the word religion, within the word religion is the word region. The word region. Take away two letters, an L and an I, and you get the word region. Add a couple letters, an L and an I, and you've got religion. Religion is a region. A region which the author, sorry, which the main character of the book of Job found out, is a region where the light is as darkness. What does that mean? Because all crisis that has to do with religion comes from this one this one thing this one thing of this one this one experience of realizing that religion has been a region separating us from actual intellect by a darkness that has appeared to be light what does that mean the book of isaiah 5 and 20 Isaiah 5 and verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for darkness. Darkness that is light has exchanged what is devotionally healthy for what is devotionally unhealthy. What is the darkness that is as light? Going back to Isaiah 1, 11 to 15, we're going to run through some lists here. What is the darkness that is as light? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of rams or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. The one, the one trait of that land that is full of darkness, but that light is as darkness, is the religious routine. It is the religious routine that we are now finding out the deity or the living God 
quote unquote, God actually does not like, actually does not benefit from, and we don't benefit from it, that's becoming a frustration. We're seeing its irrelevance. That's causing a crisis because the general religious experience and the assumed religious experience is one that has to do with routine, ritual, rite, and so forth, ordinance, sacrament, and so on. When we're learning that these things don't do anything for us and that the actual mind of the living God does not sanction them, that's beginning to change everything for us. And that's beginning to change how we think about how we carry the, the body of our understanding or how we carry the character of the conscience connected to our devotional conversation. So what else can we say? The region, the region that is filled with darkness, but that light is as darkness. What, what else can we say that region does to stir up the anxiety that we are having and are associating to trauma, religious trauma? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The next disturbance can come from the character of the deity himself. Whether you are in the Old Testament or the quote-unquote New Testament, the deity is supposed to, it is assumed, love you, but will kill you if you don't love him correctly according to the routine that should be given and are not worshipping that deity or quote-unquote God right. If you do not commit yourself to right worship, you will die and he will kill you. That can be an issue. Isaiah 65, three through five, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, stand by thyself, come not near me for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. The next issue that can aggravate us is the issue of the community of the deity, the congregation. The congregation, the community, they're, they are rude. They're everything that we want to attribute that character to. They are a reflection or supposed to be a reflection of the assumed character that we have of quote unquote God. But they are not. They reflect the actual character of quote-unquote deity, which is the character of, I'll kill you now if you don't respect me. I won't help you unless you help me. That can be an issue. What else? Micah 3, 1 through 3. And I said, here I pray you, O heads of Jacob and you princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones, chop them in pieces, as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron? The character of priest, pastor, and minister then becomes an issue, and it's no surprise. So no surprise that we find ourselves traumatized from the experience that we are having with religion, with our religious experience, with our religious belief, and with quote-unquote God. Isaiah 29, 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by who? None other than the precept of men. The issue with pastor, priest, and minister, the issue with priesthood is that they have a desire to rule over the conscience. So we're finding that our conscience is being ruled by a script, a religious script that may not be suitable to the, to the lifestyle, to the mindset, to the experience that we are having and what is being fed to us. It's becoming out of date. It's not becoming relevant. We're disconnecting from it because initially we're seeing that it is disconnected from us. Galatians 6.13 for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. It's very plain of the experience that we are seeing happening to us. And that's really going on around us. So to review, the coma of religion. What is the crisis that's waking us up from the coma of religion? Number one is the illogical religious routine. Number two is the illogical character of the deity. 
Number three is the illogical character of the deity's people. Number four is the illogical character of the religious leaders. And number five is the dogma that is a script made and fit to rule the conscience for a desire that is so disconnected from us that we are feeling resentment and anger towards it, frustration and sorrow ultimately. This crisis, it's not because of us. We may be feeling it, but we have to realize that we are not the problem. There's nothing to be sorry about for having an, an intellectual desire for a devotional experience that transcends the general religious plateau. There is nothing wrong with having an intellectual desire for a devotional experience that transcends the traditional religious experience, which traditional religious experience will plateau and will need human stimulus to make sure that it continues to where we want it to continue to. Eventually, that's going to be tiring, and eventually the infatuation of doing so is going to wear off, and we're going to start to feel something not right, and that something not right is going to cause us to react in a certain way that will lead to trauma, and not knowing where that trauma is coming from, we are registering unregistered crisis. We have gone through and are going through a crisis that we're not registering as a crisis. It's traumatic. We're not realizing that where it stems from. We're not seeing the roots. All we're seeing is our feeling because the experience has been human. It has been a human experience, a human spiritual experience driven by feeling. When you have an experience driven by feeling, you have an experience of believing that it's ownership. When you believe that you are in an experience driven by feeling and it's, a, and it's an experience of ownership, we're going to be demanding and expecting from whatever we think we own in a way that we want it to. And when it doesn't, we're going to come crashing down and it's going to hurt. And that realization, that crash, that's going to change everything. And how we handle that change, that determines how we grow and what we learn from that experience. Ever wonder if your faith truly reflects your experience? Discover the essence of a living and breathing faith in A Faith That Works. A Faith That Works challenges you to not just believe, but to act on your beliefs in a positive way. Cooperate with the Bible to cultivate a faith that doesn't just speak, but also acts. Give your faith the chance to shine. Your journey is unique. A faith that works encourages personal reflection to find your devotional essence. Deepen your connection with the Bible. Let its devotional character shine through your actions. Experience the transformative power of a book challenging you to examine your faith. Let it change you. Let it guide you. Embark on a journey to explore the depths of your beliefs. Let a faith that works be your compass. We are supposed to learn and we are supposed to grow from our experiences. We can't learn and we can't grow from our experiences if every one of our experiences are true. There is no such thing as a true experience. There are a number of angles that provide our experiences with the credibility to correct us that we will never know if we go into it having already known what is supposed to be correcting us or having already the correction from the correction that we're supposed to get after the encounter or the situation or the event. Life is about correction. Life is about growth. And that's not simply just held to our natural life. That goes for the devotional life. Everything that we have built up stems from our childhood. Everything that we think to be true stems from our childhood. And we will grow up and we will have a mind and a level of awareness of our own to discern that what was once believed is not. There is, with our devotional conversation, the same sort of natural growth as with our human being. How we grow as a human is the same way that we should be looking at how we grow devotionally. And devotionally, the human being never really remains within the natural womb, so the Devotional conversation should never actually remain within the womb of its conversation. It has to break out. And the only way that it can is shedding the skin of lies. Everything that we know in this life is a lie. Our eyes lie to us about what we see outside of it. Neurologically and physiologically, our mind lies to us about our thoughts. What we think is not actually the case. It actually never is. 
it's the same thing. Realizing that there is and has been deception within our devotional experience doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us innately. Doesn't mean that there's something going on with the experience innately. All we are doing is now having a conscious experience of the design. And the designed experience is one of deception. The devotional conversation mirrors the experience of the human being. The two should parallel each other. And we will, we will see that they do the more that we go on in our experience. They do. And the counsel within the scriptures, the, the mind at the core of the scriptures, understands that. We just don't yet because we don't know it. But as we go through it, patiently and temporally, we, we, we will know that the process of what is called the conversion, the process of arising from crisis, the, the process of moving on from religious trauma, it all stems from the fact that we are needing to solve deception. We can't let it go unregistered. Norman Skanov first used the term deconversion in 1981 to describe the stages and process of exit from new religious movements. To him, deconversion consisted of an acceptance of life's ambiguity and of the non-exclusiveness of any so-called truth. John Barbour, in his book Versions of Deconversion, further develops the understanding and use of the term to suggest conversion from and conversion toward are alternative perspectives on the same process. Every deconversion is a conversion as well as its reverse. The growing body of research draws from the more positive connotation and history of conversion to describe a similar reflective process of transformative learning. Tom Bedouin and Patrick Hornbeck define deconversion as a change in one's practices and beliefs from an inherited religious tradition as it is articulated by that tradition's authorities. This process can lead to migrations within a tradition from center to margins or a distinctive self-authored and integrated form of faith and identity beyond the boundaries of tradition. Deconversion research suggests the process begins when a religious learner, often in response to the encounter with pluralism and for the sake of spiritual fulfillment, authenticity, or a renewed sense of divine presence in both personal and communal life deconstructs what has been provided and searches for more salient notions than what ecclesial authorities emphasize. According to Heinz Schreb and colleagues, comprehensive quantitative and qualitative cross-cultural study that explores this affiliation through this more affirmative lens, leaving religion does not mean relinquishing concern with religion and religious praxis. At least half of deconverts maintain a religious or spiritual identity. And the only way that that can take place is through the lie that our devotional conversation went through. The process that the Bible highlights is a process called justification. Justification is, in a better term, cleansing, clearing, washing. It is the devotional conversation, not the human being, that needs to be cleansed, washed, refreshed, regenerated. The Bible's philosophy is about resurrecting the devotional conversation, and this resurrection is called justification. Now, if the if there is a process of justification within the scriptures, and if it is a process concerning the devotional conversation, that should allow us to know that there is something wrong with our initial experience. The Bible has a problem with the initial religious experience. The, f the, the, five, the five listed problems that lead to the crisis of the devotional conversation, the Bible has an issue with. And the Bible sections out these issues by allowing the individual to know that they need to go through a personal experience where their mind, their intellectual and devotional mind, it is growing and that growth is allowing the kind of transformation that it needs to have to affect the human being. Affecting the human being, the human being will take in that relationship now. It will no longer be about infatuation between the being of the human and the being of the devotional character. It will no longer be about infatuation. It will be about sense. It will be about actual love. And love is not an emotion. It will be about actual sense, actual affection, actual love, 
actual desire, most importantly, actual learning. That's what all studies show. All studies show that individuals, individuals maintain, they do not separate from their actual desire to understand what's within the scriptures. They actually move forward in their understanding for a more intimate and personal experience with the mind at the core of the scriptures. Studies are reflecting what the philosophy at the core of the scriptures have for the intended experience. This is what's intended. And despite the crisis that's occurring, the crisis that's occurring, despite everything that's taking place, it is the intended experience that the Bible's mind wants to have their individual learner, their individual student to go through. The intended experience is one where they are shedding the skin of the blueprint, which blueprint is the religious world, they're moving on from the religious world. They're moving on from religious tradition. They're moving on from religious theory. Bible knows this is wrong. Bible knows this is wrong. They're moving on from it to have a more intimate and personal connection to the mind at its core. So despite what we may be feeling, despite what we may be thinking, despite what we may be going through, it's all for a reason. And the reason is for our growth devotionally, which in turn will affect the growth of our human beings.